on the first day we've got a, uh, a team time trial we've got something like uh, 12 teams of six people and they do a short time trial and then tomorrow they climb up Alpe d'Huez we're right in the middle of the Tour de France and everyone knows about Alpe d'Huez it's not on the tour this year well first time in 21 years but these triathletes swim bikers and runners have to climb Alpe d'Huez in the middle of a triathlon then they run at the end of it at, uh, at 10,000 feet Hi everybody, Ross here, and this is episode 7 of the Streak Podcast. Now I'm sure plenty of you are fans of the Tour de France, for the gripping three weeks of racing, or, like me, more for the scenery and the parallel stories. While there used to be a triathlon stage race modelled on cycling's Tour de France, it was a big deal in the triathlon world. It was unique, some experimental race formats were used, and many top athletes attended. So the audio clip you just heard was from Eurosport's 1993 coverage of the Trophy SNCF, with Ian Sweet explaining the two-stage test event that would become a triathlon stage race called the France Iron Tour. The France Iron Tour was then organised from 1994 until 1998, and a few times in the 2000s. At least that's all I have paper or internet evidence of. Jonathan and Alistair Brownlee even raced for their French club, Sartreville, in 2010. I'll link to a couple of stages from that year in the show notes. After the 1994 event, Mike Pig was quoted in the December issue of Inside Triathlon magazine as saying, quote, This is the best thing that has happened to the sport in 10 years. You have to be there every day. And as I got stronger every day, the rest of the field got stronger. It was awesome. End quote. By far the best Iron Tour available on YouTube is the 1996 edition. I'll also link to that video in the show notes. There was a team of British athletes taking part, sponsored by Haribo, and I got to race stage five as part of a Franche Comté region composite team. I'm going to go through the events year by year, from 1994 to 1996 or 1997, but today I'm covering the 1993 version that was organised as a kind of proof of concept for sponsors, municipalities, the federation and the athletes. The event consisted of a sprint distance team time trial on Saturday the 26th of June in downtown Grenoble, and then a middle distance race on Sunday the 27th of June, with a finish at the top of Alpe d'Huez. The first triathlon that went up Alpe d'Huez took place the year before, and was called the Triathlon International de Grenoble. The race was created by Carol Galli, who was also behind the Iron Tour. I'll link to a short video in the show notes. Nor was the 1993 Grenoble event the first triathlon team time trial. The world's first took place in Mimizon in July 1992. It was again a test event for La Coupe de France that would be held at the same venue in October 1992. After the two-day Trophy SNCF, a race report was published in the August 1993 edition of the French language triathlete magazine. I've done a quick translation for you. Here we go, day one, quote, It was a good try, but not a total success. The potential format of the Iron Tour had a few problems due to the novelty of the race. These issues will need to be fixed in the future. It was one o'clock when the first team threw itself into the swirling water of the Isère River. The competitors, who had been told the water was 12 degrees, discovered that the rough water was not much over 9 degrees. A serious difference in conditions that numbed many athletes and added to the main difficulty of the day, staying together as a team. All 11 teams seemed to have a strategy to stay in formation and protect their best runners – even though they were more used to racing individually. Most of the athletes got to the bike-to-run transition without too much trouble, but the difficulties started with the bike. Despite their skills as cyclists, not every triathlete knows how to ride as a team. A few days before the race, some athletes were not even aware that they would need to ride together. Finally, only the teams that had plenty of experience riding as a peloton managed to stay together during the bike leg. Poissy was easily the best at this. Patrick Girard explained that their plan to stay together and save the legs of their best runners was well carried out. 
so well in fact that the group was clocked at over 60 kilometers an hour on some of the straight sections on the course. Amongst the others, except Saint-Quentin, who was slowed by Rob Burrell's puncher, and Casse d'Epargne, who posted the best bike split, there was total panic. Some athletes who lost time in the swim never caught their teammates, and other groups broke up. The harmony hoped for was replaced by a shambles, leaving spectators unable to understand the racing. And it didn't get any better on the run. The fact that only three athletes out of six in each team would count for the team's time must have completely derailed the plans to stay together. So the race just looked like a normal individual sprint triathlon that we're used to seeing. Athletes crossed the line one by one, not in groups, sometimes with a three or four minute gap between the first and last members of a team. The only exception was Poissy, who again played the team game to the end, as all six of their athletes finished within a minute of each other. Was there a lack of experience racing as a team, or does the race format and rules need to be changed? This was the question being asked by the officials and the athletes themselves. But was the solution simply what Jacques Laparade, president of the French Triathlon Federation, explains here? Quote, The organisers should have trusted the rules put in place by the Federation so that everything runs smoothly. The rule put in place for Mimizon worked perfectly and should have been used here. This is a problem that the organisers absolutely need to fix if they want to have a team time trial in future editions of the Iron Tour. End quote. Now here's a note from me about what Jacques Laparade was talking about. At La Coupe de France team time trial in October 1992, the team's finish time was taken after the third athlete of five crossed the line. This incentivized teams to make sure that at least three athletes stayed together on the run and worked and looked like a team. However, in Grenoble in 1993, the decision was taken to work out a mathematical average time of the first three athletes across the line in each team, therefore encouraging the stronger runners to run on ahead, which for the spectacle of this exciting new team format looked rubbish. And now here's day two from the same article. Quote, Rob Burrell, with the effects of the Nice triathlon still in his legs, couldn't hold off Mike Pig in this high-quality race. Note from me, Nice was two weeks earlier, over 4 kilometres, 120 kilometres and 32 kilometres, and Burrell finished third behind Mark Allen and Simon Lessing. After the team time trial, Ben Bright, the young Australian, spoke about five names as possible favourites. Himself, Mike Pig, Rob Burrell, Nick Croft and Jean-Luc Capogna. He wasn't wrong, because these were the five athletes that chased each other up the climb. From the start of the swim, Bright and Croft got themselves to the front and stayed there. They came out of the lake with a 30-second lead on Pig, Capogna and Barrel. But quickly Jean-Luc Capogna, pushing a huge gear, caught up to and eventually dropped Bright. Rob Burrell and Mike Pig were just about hanging on. Behind these four, a group of about 15 athletes was getting organised, ignoring the no-drafting rule and chasing as hard as possible. This lasted until the bottom of the climb, when the 21 mythical corners caused the groups to explode and the rule of everybody for themselves took over. Tired from his earlier efforts, Jean-Luc Capogna left the front of the race to Mike Pig at the bottom of the climb. Pig stayed in front until the top, pushing 39.23 or even 39.21 from time to time. Rob Burrell racked his bike a minute behind the American, but this time gap was quickly reduced like melting snow in the sun, and although Burrell overtook Pig, he couldn't completely drop him. The two men know each other well, but running a half marathon at altitude after having ridden one of the hardest climbs in France is a perilous exercise, and Rob Burrell paid for it, as Mike Pig, with a last effort, came back past him to steal the victory. End quote. Now enjoy some highlights I've spliced together from the Eurosport coverage. Oh, <laughs> 
Group. We're on the first uh, event, which is a team tire and trial, and it starts in Grenoble in the, uh, the River Isa, and they swim 750 meters downstream, so it'll be pretty quick, and then they jump on the bike and do a 20 kilometer time trial bike and then a 10 kilometer run. So the first team are away, and this is the Volvic team. This is the favorite for the, uh, the race, though. This is the Saint Quentin on Evening team. And they've been trained together specially for this race. The other teams to watch out for are Poisson, Attion, and Cassé uh, de Pagne. Saint Quentin team is out on the bike right now, the 20 kilometer time trial. This is the Volvic team. Here they were the first team away. And there are only five of them left. They've dropped one already. One didn't uh, get with them on the swim. This is the Athion team, sorry, this is Mike Pig, the American Mike Pig, a couple of Americans in this, a couple of Australians, Nick Croft, see Pig shouting them, trying to uh, organize them, get them in the right, uh, right order to take advantage of each other on the uh, on this time trial. There we are, Mike Pig saying good job, Stephen Foster just coming through here, Troy Caston team, that's uh, Hamish Carter, Ben Bright's in this team, who won the uh, Updoers race last year. This is the Poissy team back into the transition. They're second in the transition. Well, they were second off. This time they're one of the few teams that have all stuck together. So the Poissy team going out in force for the final part of this race. The Athion team comes back. The Mike Pig uh, contingent. And they wrap their bikes and uh, get ready for the final 10 kilometers. Saint Quentin and Evelyn were the fastest team. Athlon was second and Poissy third. But this is Stephen uh, or Stefan Bia of the Saint Quentin on team and they wondered about the preparation and uh, he said they've had good team preparation and uh, he was first like, uh, like the team French team club champions last year although their best athlete Thierry Henry is injured and didn't race with them today they start at Lake Teresa's where they do uh, what, a 2.5 kilometer swim then they've got a bike, something like 80 kilometers, and the last 16 or so are up outdoors. Yeah, so this is Nick Croft, first out of the water, Australian. And then Benny Bright, he won in Ironbridge last year in Great Britain. Ben Bright has a quick change. And uh, about one and a half minutes later, we've got 16 men. We've got Mark Lees wearing number 26, Bob Barroza, Mike Pig's there, Stephen Foster, the Australian, Paul Blondier, the Belgian, uh, Morifumi Kojima is there, the Japanese, Jean-Luc Caponia is there as well, 44, that's Joss Everts, so Pig's pulling away, I understand at one time he had a three minute lead, but Rob Burrell is clawing it back as they get towards the, uh, the summit of the Alpe d'Huez climb. Pig power, you can just see it on the back. Mike Pig, though, he's up to the summit of Alpe d'Huez. Comes from uh, Alcada, California. So his pig heads off for this 22 kilometers, 20 kilometers rather, at 10,000 uh, feet. And they've got quite a climb here. Uh, two laps, Benny Bright just coming in. And as they get towards the end of the first lap, in fact, uh, Rob Burrell has made up that minute or so deficit he had at the top of the bike and uh, has gone past uh, Pig to take the lead. This is Jos Evert. Of course, when I man Europe last year, Stephen Foster, the Australian, coming through. That's he in about uh, fourth or fifth place. So that's lap one over, and it's still Bob Burrell with uh, Pig just behind. He's about 20 seconds behind with one lap to go. But at the turn, Pig's gone to the head again. Burrell's blown it, but Pig's going to win it. And he's going to win in four hours, 15, 18 seconds. Oh, he looks exhausted, doesn't he? You can blame him. But he's won a Fiat car, and he's picked up... Uh, uh, I should think quite a substantial amount of that 70,000 francs on offer for the team. This is Bobby Barrow, finishes in second place, racing for Saint Quentin. Just uh, two minutes adrift, well, 159, 417, 17. And Jos Evert places third. Oh, what did Pig think of this, I wonder? This race took everything out, out of me. Rob Burrell chased me up the mountain. He was only 30 seconds back, 20 seconds back. And then he took off running, and the way he was running, I go, it's your race. But I hung in there, I hung in there. Were you afraid to lose? But uh, he was looking very strong, so I was questioning it. But I didn't want to give up the race, so I kept on running hard. Well, that's it for Eurosports coverage of the Oak Doers Triathlon. This is Ian Sweet wishing you good night. In the triathlete article, there was also this sidebar. 
where the magazine started to envisage a longer event in the future. Quote, France Iron Tour, myth or reality? Even if we ignore the organisational errors that we saw, is a France Iron Tour actually possible? Finding venues, getting the media interested and attracting sponsors is not easy. But the main problem is maybe finding athletes willing to take part in a potentially 10-day event. Will they be motivated to give it their best shot? Or is it too hard to race well every day? The organisers need to think carefully about this before going ahead with the project. End quote. The September issue of TED magazine was a bit more positive about the team time trial fiasco, saying that the athletes didn't really have enough time to prepare for it. And here's a great quote. The Tour de France of triple effort is a sea snake that has been emerging from the deep since triathlon has been triathlon. We'd love that in 1994, Carol Galley, helped by her technical consultant Jean-Luc Capogna, can finally give us a triathlon Tour de France worthy of its name. End quote. They finish by asking some other questions about the hoped-for 1994 race that, they said, weren't really answered in the post-race press conference. 1. When will the plans for the 1994 race be made public? 2. What are the conditions for entry into the event? I guess they are referring not only to entry fees, but also the composition of teams. 3. Which towns will welcome the race? And what's the motivation for a town to apply to host a stage? 4. How will the athletes be looked after? Hotels, transfers, etc. 5. Will the race be open to amateur athletes and or female athletes? 6. What will the prizes be? Referring to prize money and leaders' jerseys. 7. How will the race be publicised and or televised? 8. How many stages will there be? Will there be rest days? And finally, 9. With the ITU, ETU, TPT and Ironman circuits, will this event not just be another thing to slot into the calendar? Now, 1993 and 1994 really was a golden age of triathlon for me. I was getting stronger and my results were getting better. I was winning local stuff and featuring a bit nationally. I was also starting to think about moving to France after I'd finished my degree at the University of Brighton. In the summer of 1993, I found myself in France on a family holiday with entries into two Grand Prix events, Boujalouf on the 1st of August and chervey Cuba on the 8th of August. I didn't race the second weekend as I didn't fancy the cold, wet technical bike course. But at Boujalouf, I got a taste of the French scene and the Grand Prix circuit up close. I saw the matching team bikes racked up and the loud club kits covered in sponsors and then racing in the afternoon on closed roads through villages packed with spectators. I also listened to the English accents of the well-known but also the journeyman pros in transition, overhearing conversations about joining teams, racing every week, sometimes twice a week, epic travel stories to get from event to event, and racing hard for checks made out in French francs. I knew then that I wanted to do something similar, but more on that in later episodes. So did the France Iron Tour happen in 1994? Check out episode 8 of the Street Podcast, which is out right now, to find out. The show notes for this episode are at thestreetpodcast.com forward slash podcast forward slash 7. If you've got a question, a correction, some extra historical information, or just want to say hi, then you can email me at thestreetpodcast at gmail.com. I'll leave you with a very enthusiastic Rob Burrell giving his thoughts on the possibility of an eight-day race being organised in 1994. It will be harder, of course, and the races will be slower and more technical. But um, I think um, it's no harder than the Tour de France because we, every two days we're supposed to have one rest day and um, the stages are not really long. It only finishes with a long stage like this one. So I think um, it, it, it is very well possible to do it. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's not something crazy. It's just the races will be slower. 